kind of a background for everybody. And then what we usually do is kind of just go into Q and A session, which tends to really answer the questions that they have, obviously, which is the main point of having you on, I think. So if you could just kick us off with a little bit about yourself and your story, and then we'll go from there. Sure, I'll try to be interesting. Uh, so I'm Sarah Wilson, I'm 33, and I currently live in College Station, Texas. I know y'all are mostly high school and college ages, so I actually work at Texas A&M University, and so I get to work with uh, people y'all's age all the time, and I think especially my interns are really fantastic, and I try to slip in a little financial wisdom every once in a while, <laughs> but who knows if they'll take it or not, though most of our, our people are really, really smart. Oh, cool, Ben, you almost went there. And um, yeah, I uh, currently, I only have one real estate property it is a duplex. I paid 230,000 at the very top of the pandemic last year. And I could probably sell my house for a little over 300 K this year. So that's how fast things move in real estate <laughs> mm -hmm. and which is pretty cool. And I actually net $150 a month while house hacking it. So I uh, recently did a turnover in my rental unit and my renter pays twelve fifty a month, and I'm also kind of double house hacking it. My boyfriend lives with me. I charge him five hundred dollars a month because I'm nobody's sugar mama, and so I net one hundred and fifty over the mortgage every single month, and I don't have to pay for any of my housing. So that by itself should be a uh, pretty pretty good blueprint to follow for doing some sort of multifamily or house hacking as one of your first properties. Um, yes, sir. I, I'll, yeah. Sorry, I'll jump in real quick since you mentioned house hacking and congrats by the way on your successful house hack. Uh, Thank you. We have one member who's on tonight. Jabbar is, um, is house hacking. Uh, he closed on her, his first property, I wanna say two to three months ago and just got it filled up. And so he's still kind of getting through the hurdles and learning the ropes, but it's going well. Um, another guy on the call, Taylor, uh, who's actually working. So I think his camera's off. Um, we have a couple of people who are just working and listening. Uh, but Taylor is under contract and will be closing. I think he said in about, I think he said the 21st. So about five days on his first house hack. Um, and then pretty much everybody else on the call is a future house hacker. I would say it's a safe bet. Um, Wonderful. We're definitely That's sold so on that strategy. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a really solid strategy and I wish I had known about it when I was younger. Um, I wasn't quite ready to buy until now, but, uh, because I did the whole, went to college, took out more student loans than I needed and never really had a financial education thing. So I went out into the world at 22, um, got a newspaper job for $26,000 a year and uh, let my student loans sit for a couple of years and ended up with $33,000 in debt, making $26,000 a year. And then I got laid off. <laughs> yeah. So I then had to go through a really fun three-year process of um, just trading in all of my hobbies for trying to make money and figuring out how to live on an extremely tiny income, single person, no like familial support kind of situation. And I figured it out. So it's absolutely possible, but quite frankly, if I was starting at y'all's age, I could have avoided that entire situation and gotten started a lot sooner. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What questions do y'all have for me? Oh, and there was the whole, like, I documented it on the internet. And so now people like Dan asked me to come on these things. No, I, and I want you to go more in depth on that, please. Uh, your blog, your website, social media, um, they don't be modest. So kind of start us off in the beginning of when you started dark documenting your journey. I think, I think if I'm, if I'm right, it was right about the time that you got laid off. Is that yeah. true? And yeah. So, so I was on unemployment out of work for like five months and I swore to my, so I was, it was like 400 bucks a month. I was making an unemployment and you can't work on unemployment because then they take that out of your check, which is a crazy thing. So I was like barely able to live and feed myself. And I swore, and I also had all these student loan debts just hanging over my head. It was terrifying, quite frankly. And I thought I was going to have to like waitress with a college degree, which is not the worst thing in the world, but it's the same time. It's not what anybody plans. So I promised myself as soon as I get a new job, I'm going to figure this whole money thing out. I am going to make a really strict budget, hence the moniker budget girl. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to pay off debt. So 
I got another job making about 26,000 a year in Hammond, Louisiana as a newspaper reporter. And I moved there not knowing anybody in the state, got a shitty apartment. Sorry, y'all are old enough. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my dog protected me slightly, but it was, it was not good. And I worked as much as humanly possible. I worked as much overtime as possible. I picked up secret shopping. Um, there was this thing where a secret shopping company sent me to Walmart gas stations and had me buy cigarettes to see if they would card me. And then I would resell the cigarettes. So I was kind of double hustling there. I trained people's dogs. I cleaned people's houses. I did a little retail arbitrage before that was a thing where I picked up stuff at yard sales, sold it on the internet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I paid off 10 grand that first year. And then I paid off 10 grand that next year. And then I got another job um, where I was making 4,000 more in Mena, Arkansas, where there is nothing to do but stare at cows. And uh, I uh, made a little bit more there and I ended up paying off my debt. And then <laughs> I moved to College Station, Texas, where there was actual city and people and uh, people that weren't marrying their cousins. And uh, that, was, that was really nice. And I make more money now uh, <laughs> during that whole process. I, uh, as soon as I moved to Louisiana, I didn't know anyone there. So I picked up a camera and I started just talking about my journey on YouTube at the time. There are a ton of financial YouTubers now, but at the time there were two, um, his and well, three, his and her money, um, Lydia sin who did frugal debt free life and a couple that is no longer to longer together, but they ran a channel called debt is dumb. And so these were dual income, uh, family folk. Nobody was doing it single. Nobody was doing it low income. So I just started talking to the internet and documenting my process. And somewhere along the way, people kept telling me I was stupid and I couldn't possibly do it. So I started sharing my numbers as in my actual budgets every single month. And like you could see what day I went to eat Taco Bell <laughs> and uh, you know, what day I uh, got, did pizza delivery and how many tips I made. And by being completely transparent about my money on the internet, I was able to kind of start a little bit of a trend and I gained a little bit of a following, you know, I'm no Graham Stephan, but I'm, um, I'm still out there doing it. And yeah, I've kind of tracked my finances over the years. I paid off all $33,000 worth of debt. I saved up a huge emergency fund. I saved up for this duplex and then a duplex emergency fund. And now I'm saving for the next property. Awesome. Um, I might've missed it, but what, well, I know I, I can see why you left Arkansas, but what, what uh, prompted you to go to College Station? Was it another job? Uh, yeah, I, while I was in Arkansas, I pretty much decided I wanted to get out of the journalism game because there's no health insurance or retirement benefits and they don't pay you very well. I was running a weekly newspaper by myself um, mm -hmm. with just like an advertising team and that requires a lot of hours and just isn't, I love journalism, but it's not a great place to be in career wise right now. So I started looking for a way to segue into a different type of communications work. And so I started applying for um, jobs doing writing and producing video and social stuff for college communications, mm -hmm. which is still kind of journalism, but it's advocate journalism. So we write about the stuff that our students and our faculty and staff are doing and we try to get it in the media. And I kind of had a back end door on that and they they really like people with journalism backgrounds and chops and i was able to do that and i immediately doubled my income from what it used to be <laughs> and you didn't have to live in arkansas anymore i didn't have to live in arkansas <laughs> anymore and i had full benefits and i like have normal hours and i don't have to carry a police scanner around and i don't have to take pictures of dead bodies oh, bonus bonus and, and no knock against that, arkansas actually. we we have a couple members of our group who live in arkansas uh I heard it, it can be awesome. There's some good mountain biking there I've heard, which I want to check that out someday. But um, so also in this group, um, Sarah, we have, uh, we talk about documenting their journey as these young people kind of begin their, their learning and their, their uh, successes and buying properties and side hustles and documenting their journey. And there's, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Can you speak a little bit about your YouTube, your blog website, and your Instagram, and how those have each worked for you, maybe the pros and cons. Um, and if you're willing, maybe even are those, have those become passive income streams and, and how much have those become passive income streams for you? 
Absolutely. And I'm always willing to talk about the numbers because I think if you aren't talking about the numbers, you're not being like a good storyteller in this because people actually want to know the facts. So <laughs> um, when I started on YouTube, I didn't really realize it was going to be a money-making venture because it wasn't that popular then. Um, that sounds, that makes me sound like I'm really old, but that was only seven years ago, y'all. Uh, <laughs> people were making a ton of money off of YouTube then. Um, I did start getting little like $100, $200 checks a month as my views continued to rise. And then I got a few sponsorship deals through Mina um, in Hammond and Mina where they'd give me like a free subscription to a photo site for a year or like a hundred dollars to produce an entire video or they'd just send me like some free glasses and eventually I was able to kind of realize that that wasn't worth my time even when I had you know just 20,000 people as an audience and I was able to start um, negotiating and FinCon do you all know what FinCon is kind of I think most so, of them do yeah um I was invited there and I went and I was able to kind of start networking with other people in this space, which really, really helps. So I'm so happy that y'all have this because in masterminds like this and in groups like that, when people can share numbers with each other and, and anytime anyone has ever messaged me saying like, Hey, I'm thinking of working with glasses USA. I go, here's how much they pay me. And here's how much I think you can get. <laughs> and uh, um, I think it's really important to share those numbers because some people are making bank off of this and other people are trading um, an entire sponsored video for a free pair of glasses. So um, okay. currently I charge between $900 and $2,000 for a sponsored YouTube video. Um, my social media rates run about seven to $900 for like, usually it's a series of posts and it kind of depends on the season right now um just off of sponsored videos for this month i'll make about five grand uh for four or five vids and there are always more opportunities honestly than i uh take than i take advantage of because there are so many people that reach out that want you to shill something that's just completely crazy or stupid i try really hard to only work with people that are a legitimate and B that are, I would actually recommend. So I've partnered with Morning Brew, with Glasses USA, with Skillshare, and uh, some uh, extra laundry detergent. <laughs> they are not the most glamorous brands, but I honestly, uh, I, I like them and I don't have a problem with them. So it's, it's very important to kind of get your negotiating chops on and also just try to compare. I would honestly just reach out to other creators if I know that they work with a brand and be like, hey, how much are they pay in you? And uh, what's the deal on here? Are they secretly really shitty to work with? Because some, some of them are. Like in some of my masterminds, we have kind of a hit list of people we just don't work with. And they can reach out to us all day long. And it's like, no, you did real shitty by my friend. I'm not going to work with you. And Got it. Yeah. Um, and so what does your current content creation look like uh, for YouTube, Instagram, and your blog site? Are you still cranking out a lot of quality content? Have you taken a step back? Um, what does that look like for you? On the, more like a weekly basis, I guess. Yeah. Um, I am trying very hard to do one to two videos a week. I have a video editor that I've been working with for the past year. I used to edit everything myself. Um, and we have finally kind of gotten to the point where he can run an edit of a video of mine with, you know, it doesn't take 10 times longer than it would take for me to do it myself for him to do it. He's actually gotten pretty fast and that's wonderful. And he's, uh, he's based overseas. He only charges $30 a video, which is fantastic. Wow. <laughs> there are a lot of people that charge a lot more. Um, and I have a couple of web people that I pay weekly and I'm trying to get one article a week out. I've been less good about that. And I also have an Etsy that I've been trying to develop some more content for. And uh, I also have, fallen off of that the last couple of months. It's always kind of a juggling game <laughs> and sometimes you're gonna let stuff fall. Uh, YouTube is kind of the powerhouse and that's what I get paid the most for. So that's the plate that I try to keep spending the most. Uh, I would love to be able to kind of offset and do some other projects, but I also still have a full-time day job and a life. So mm -hmm. it's uh, I'm outsourcing sometimes if I can. Yeah, which leads me to another question. Um, you have a full-time day job and you're, you're creating content for social media, um, writing articles, uh, and you have a boyfriend. How do you balance all of this? And is there a timeline for when you may not have a full-time regular job? 
So I get asked that a lot. And this year I'll probably make about 50 grand off of budget girl, which will meet my day job income. So, okay. however, my day job has a full benefits package. They treat me really well. Mm -hmm. And I spend most of the day scheduling things out on social media. And it's a really cush gig to be completely honest. I also am incredibly lucky to have a really good boss and a uh, really great team that I work with over there. And I cannot, after working with just a ton of really shitty people and quitting a lot of jobs just because it was horrible for these toxic people to work with, uh, I put a lot of value in that. So yes, it takes up 40 hours a week, but it also really allows me to have the mental clarity to leave work at work. And when I leave, I can go home and do this stuff or relax or whatever I need to do. And also the security there. I think a lot of people are really eager to make YouTube their full-time job. But you know what? YouTube has changed like nine times since I've been on it. Um, there have been several adpocalypses. People get demonetized for no apparent reason. Um, and the algorithm can just change day to day. Uh, a couple of months ago, I went negative for subscribers for like two months straight. The algorithm was just not pushing my videos out no matter what I did. I did like five new, you know, five things I don't buy anymore slash 50 frugal things you can do. Like the videos that I hate to do, but always do well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, didn't help. And then all of a sudden it boomed up again and I was getting seven or 8,000 new uh, subscribers a month and I was making a ton more money and it just swings, which mm. is stressful if that is your only source of income. <laughs> so I have no real plan to forego my or quit my day job anytime soon maybe when i have a few more properties um just creating passive income off of that but i would like to stick with the security job as long as i can that makes total sense um, especially it sounds like you don't hate your job you actually even kind of enjoy your job and i do i do yeah. it's not bad at all <laughs> like yeah. i it's a lot of like, I, there's a lot of overlap. Like they know about budget girl. They hired me because I had a proven track record of bringing more followers around and like mm -hmm. being able to curate content. So. Yep. Um, we, we've had other YouTube, uh, celebrities, um, on as guests and, and they have said something very similar to what you mentioned that YouTube is kind of it's very unpredictable and things can change on a dime. Uh, and so they all, as you have different income streams and that's not their only gig, even though YouTube can be very uh, profitable. You just don't people, know. Yeah. A lot of people have more regular income coming in from courses, books, affiliates, and other stuff like that, that they can really depend on. Um, I'm, I'm more of a sponsorship gal just because it's not that hard for me to do. And I have these brands that want to work with me over and over and over again, and, and they pay pretty well. I do have some affiliates, but I haven't put enough effort into that, I guess. And uh, I know some people that make double what I do on affiliates alone. So I'm trying to increase the more passive stuff like website ads will pay a lot more money than YouTube ads, for instance. And there's also a lot more longevity in websites. So you mm -hmm. have to be careful where you're putting your efforts and making sure that they are the most where it's the most effective and maximized. There okay. are some, there are some questions in the chat, by the way. Yeah. And that, cause they're getting antsy and I'm, I'm talking too much, which is what I normally do. Um, so we're going to switch gears here. Uh, are, are you headed to FinCon this fall in Austin? Yeah. It's an hour and a half away. I'll be there. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I will be there too. So I'll get to meet you in person, sir. Yay. Um, and I was going to say something else. Uh, oh, so we're going to switch gears to the Q and a, um, and I'm hoping that members, if you have questions on frugality, uh, side hustles, this is kind of Sarah's gig, um, managing a budget and maximizing the results. So, uh, what we've found that works well for us, Sarah, is that we have the members put questions in the chat, as you saw. And then, um, the downside is you don't really get to hear them say their question, but it seems to kind of keep it, um, you know, first come first serve kind of thing. So if you would be okay with this, um, just kind of read the question in the chat 
and then answer it to the best of your ability. And, and we'll just kind of go from top to bottom. And if, uh, if you have any questions or you need to take a break, just let us know. But I think that's, that's what we'll do here. Sure. Um, so Jabbar says, um, at the beginning when you weren't really profiting off of your following, what motivated you to keep posting or prioritizing creating content? So I totally get this. And if I had started my channel, like a lot of people are now as like trying to make money, I've seen so many really, really potentially awesome YouTubers like get on and they post a few videos and they're eager and they're excited. And when they don't start making money right away, they get discouraged and they quit. So I was doing it because I was in Arkansas in a town of 5,000 people and I didn't really like any of them. And <laughs> I like the people online better. So I was kind of documenting my journey more as a diary and talking to these people. And I was proud and I was excited to show them how much closer I was getting to paying off my debt and my goals. And it was just a source of entertainment for me. Those videos suck. So I'm very sorry if you watch any of them. Um, they are not high quality. I was using an iPhone 4. Um, and it, yeah, it was not good. If I had, if I had been thinking more like an entrepreneur, because I didn't even think of it as a business at that point, I just thought of it as like a very small trickle of income. Uh, I would have probably invested in some slightly better camera equipment and done a little bit more uh, work on it and possibly made some more money, but uh, it was, it was really just because I was enjoying engaging with people online and I was getting a lot of support from people who were cheering me on in this, which I didn't have in my real life. So um, I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry if it did not. <laughs> um, so that was the motivation. <laughs> So if you are going to do a YouTube channel or social media or something like that, which I encourage, I don't think it's too late for anybody. I don't think anything is oversaturated. I think you just have to kind of go in only giving it as much effort as you're willing to kind of maintain and um, not expect to make bank off of it right away. So um, Sarah, hello fellow Sarah, um, said, how'd you learn to set effective boundaries to leave work at work? So I actually, coming from journalism where... I walked around with a police scanner on my hip and had to go anytime there was a motorcycle crash and like take pictures and, uh, you know, occasionally get shot at or threatened. Um, it was super easy for me <laughs> to get a job like at Texas A&M where I go in at eight and I leave at five and then just not think about it until the next day. I, um, it's, I have a really good job and they treat us really well there and it makes it easy for uh, just to kind of leave work at work. I wasn't taking the police scanner home or I've had other jobs where they're like calling you in the middle of the night. No, no, no. It's uh, the boundaries were set and easy to respect. So a lot of it is unfortunately having a good boss. Um, let's see. All right. Marcel, if you were 18 to 21, what would you do differently to achieve financial independence? Also, how would you start building your personal brand if you had to grow it from scratch right now and what would you do to grow it? That was an excellent series of questions. Um, and I love it. So 18 to 21 means that I was going off to college by myself, uh, no financial help. I did have a bunch of scholarships that I had applied for, but I didn't do the whole like apply for every scholarship under the sun, um, thing. So I had a reasonable amount and I had some financial aid, but I wouldn't have taken out additional student loans to live off of. Like all my friends were doing, I would have taken out the minimum. And then, I worked like five jobs in college <laughs> and I spent all that money. I don't know where it went. I would have saved some of that for actual tuition and for the future. I was uh, never really taught about money. So I was kind of short minded. I would have read a few of the books, the wonderful books that are out there right now and started on a budget before I had more means. There's a, that's a huge money mistake. I see a lot of people make where they're like, I'm not going to set a budget until I have, you know, a full-time job or until I'm making more money because I don't have that much to do. And I do think there, if you can do it now and you, you can, you absolutely should. And if anyone in here wants any of my uh, budget or net worth tracking spreadsheets, I will send them to Dan and you are all are more than welcome to use them. Just start tracking your net worth now. It's the most motivating thing on the planet. Okay. If you're not already doing it. Um, Sarah, I'm going to interrupt you. Just curious, what were the jobs you had in college? <laughs> okay, so I worked at the newspaper. No surprise there. I uh, was a babysitter. 
I was a cater waiter. I cleaned an ice cream store at night and I was a dog walker. Also on holidays, when I went back home to Jackson, I sold fireworks. There you go. It just anything to make a dime, right? Uh, I'll I, share. I was always a hustler. I just don't know where the money went. Like yeah. I just spent it probably at Taco Bell and Walmart. I, I worked jobs really in college too. Um, the job I like to share in college, I had, I worked, I, I went to school in Iowa. I worked on a farm harvesting pumpkins and watermelons and gourds as a part-time job. And it paid pretty well. And I was outside. I was pretty happy. I also delivered pizzas and made pizzas and did worked in the food. I mean, that was awful, but yeah, you just, if you're a hustler, you're a hustler and you, you just make money and you make it happen. But I think I spent all mine too in graduate. I also took out student loans just because I could and mm -hmm. used it to, I don't even know. Uh, yeah. I, I regret that. Sorry to interrupt. You can head back to the chat now. No, it's a super common mistake. And like, nobody was telling me, no, you shouldn't do that. So, and I, I was an adult at that point. I could make my own decisions, but I wasn't thinking of future me. I was thinking of present me who just wanted to like buy more stuff for, you know, the sorority events and my little and stuff like that. So uh, let's see, how would you start building or how would I achieve financial independence differently? I would not do the, the extra student loan thing. I'd try to pay for her as much as my college myself as I could. And then when I got out of work, I would start budgeting immediately. Even let's just pretend that I made the same jobs and everything, same amount of money. I could have saved a little. I couldn't have saved a lot, but I could have saved a little and I could have started um, kind of doing some extra stuff on the side. I played roller derby after college for quite a while, which is a huge money sink, but was fun. Um, yeah, and I would have just kind of started saving for an emergency and I would have started budgeting earlier because once you budget, you feel like you get a raise. It feels like you have more control over your money, you know where it goes. Um, and then as I started budgeting and stuff like that, from there on pretty much stick with the same plan. <laughs> Um, how would I start building my personal brand right now if I had to grow it from scratch? And what would you do? That's a hard one because I'm pretty, I've stayed pretty true to the brand that I have. I haven't, some people will say I've gone off the rails, but those are just trolls. Uh, let's see. It's tough right now because like every single person I see on TikTok has like a coldest water sponsorship and, uh, <laughs> Um, we didn't have as many opportunities slash uh, distractions then. And I, I, damn, I sound old. Um, I would probably start with a niche, the finance niche, real estate niche, whatever niche you want and that you can actually stick with and go from that. I would avoid copying the biggest people in the space, which sounds like weird advice, but um if you're trying to be the the biggest guy out there right now, who was that? Who was that guy that had all the commercials and he turned out to be a total scammer? He's like, look at my Ferrari and my garage and my 14 billion room house. Was it Ty Lopez? Yes, thank you. I'm yeah. thinking Ty Lopez. As soon as I started seeing all those ads, I started seeing all sorts of people trying to copy that style because that's what was getting a lot of views and that was what was being talked about right then. And none of those people are still around. And we now all know that Ty Lopez was lying about like everything and it's a total scammer. Um, I mean, if you want to uh, try to be Graham Stephan or meet Kevin, sure, they're cool guys. <laughs> they're legit. Um, be careful of who your influences are, I guess is who I'm saying. And be also very careful about who you partner with and what you say, because you know what age we're in right now and everybody can pull your old tweets. And funny is not always funny. And y'all are in interest in real estate. You're not trying to be like the next big comedian or next big politician. It's uh, it's probably going to be easier to keep tabs on what you think, what's going to be appropriate. If there's a voice in your head that says, maybe we shouldn't post this, then don't post it. All right. Um, Great advice. Good advice there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, how do you build a brand on social media from scratch? Um, honestly, I kind of suck at this because I didn't even get an Instagram until like three years ago when my followers were like, no, just freaking do it. 
woman. And now it's my favorite platform. <laughs> and then I started like doing TikToks and I quit after like a month because it was just too many streams of content to do. Um, I really, I spend a lot of time on TikTok still, but I would try to start on one platform and try to build that up and then add in as needed. And honestly, I don't know if that's the best advice, but it's the only sustainable advice, I think. Um, I know a lot of people that are really successful on one platform and it's, it's all a matter of time. Do y'all know Miko, the budget mom? She's huge. You should look her up later, but she has like refused to go to TikTok because she has 600,000 followers on Instagram. That's where her entire audience is. It's a platform that she knows sells and it works for her. And I think that's smart. I mean, she's done reels and stuff, but she's not trying to do everything, which is where a lot of people kind of fall down the hole. Um, all right. How much are you making right now every month? Love that question, Ethan. Okay. So according to my budget, I make about 10 grand a month. Um, about 30 something of that, or, you know, 3000 dishes from my day job, um, 1500, which is how much my mortgage is, is from rent. So that kind of cancels itself out. And the rest is from YouTube ads, which I make about 14 to 1900 a month on depending, you know, what season it is for ads. And then the rest are sponsorships, um, and affiliates, that kind of stuff. So, and that's with kind of a lazy amount of work, like brands really have to niggle me to actually get me to do the stuff and to actually build them. So. Sarah, can you, uh, real quick for everyone, explain the difference between a sponsorship on YouTube and an affiliate on YouTube? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so a sponsorship is, um, you've, you've heard it in Skillshare. Thanks today for Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is a online learning platform where you can give people teach you stuff. And here's a thing that I looked at and I didn't actually take the class, but they told me it would be a good class to do. So here's the class. And then they pay you $900. Um, and you have to disclose affiliates are more, I recommend a product to you. You follow a link and you purchase it. I get a little kickback or a portion of your proceeds. So there are Amazon affiliates. If you go to my budget girl, Amazon shop and purchase honestly anything after following that link, I will get a little kickback of your money. If I recommend CIT bank to you, um, cause they are actually a really good bank <laughs> and you follow my link, I get $80 if you sign up for CIT bank. <laughs> um, and then there are other things like Ibotta or Rakuten and I get like a dollar if you use my link. So there's a lot of, and some people are better at this and some people are worse, but you weave those links into your content, you put them in your description box, and it's honestly really good passive income because especially if you're only recommending places and companies and people that you like, you're making money for doing nothing other than recommending what I, almost all the companies I partner with are literally ways to save people money. So I'm making money off of recommending you ways to save money that works with my brand and with my, uh, my ethics. And it's kind of a win, win, win. Also, it's a uh, very little work after setting up and just promoting the links. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. What does your, Oh, I think I lost one. I saw something that said, what was your budget look like? Oh, there's a yeah, it says, thing. Uh, okay, there we go. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. What does your budget look like starting versus now? What tools do you like best? So um, I'm happy to show you guys my budget and I'm going to send a, uh, you all a copy of my Excel slash Google Sheets budget and you're welcome to use it. I use the, it's very customizable. So I use Google Sheets, which is just a spreadsheet free version of Excel and I can uh, customize it as much as I want. If an app works for you, awesome. If pen and paper works for you, awesome. I do not care how you budget. <laughs> um, I can show you my, but my very first budget. Heck, if you want to let me screen share, I'd be happy to show you my very first budget and I can show you my budget this month and how much it has changed. Can I screen share? Yes, yeah, sir. Let's do it. I'll, I'll add you as a, um, make host. So you should be able to screen share now. Awesome. One minute. 
and I'll attempt to answer another question. I do it. Um, yeah, so as far as changes, uh, the main thing is that it's gotten a lot bigger. So I was working with 1600 bucks a month or like 1400 bucks a month when I first started. So my budget was kind of tiny. I wasn't, you know, I'm still logging every single purchase that I make and, uh, but there are all sorts of new templates for business expenses and real estate in income and expenses. It's a lot different. It's not a lot different. It's a little different. And let's see. When building a brand on social media, should I start a new account focused on business and real estate? Or should I just use my personal account that I already have? Um, okay, so two ways of thinking of that because I know people that do both. I don't have any personal accounts on social media. I mean, I have a Facebook account, but I have a separate budget roll page. And it kind of depends on how much you want there to be separation between yourself and your business. Um, that said on Instagram, I only have go budget girl, same on Twitter, same on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, so I think, and I know people who have grown their business to the point where they have to create a separate account for personal use, just so it's not so flooded with all these DMS and stuff. Um, but if you only have enough energy to curate one, I'd say do personal and drop your stuff in. Or if you're really whole hog on this business thing and you don't want it all fluffered up with, you know, pictures of your dogs that said people really, really like pictures of my dogs. They do really well. I have, I'm an all in one combo girl. So do what you wish with that information. Okay. Uh, I can screen share now. I found the budget. Share screen. So I don't know if this is my first budget, but this is from 2012. Also, if any of you come at me about the number of tabs I had, just know that I have like three other windows open with just as many. Um, <laughs> as you can see, I was doing a no spend month here and my monthly income was 1440. So compare that to 10 K a month. Now, uh, my rent was due and I don't know why there was an extra $60 for rent, car insurance, Netflix, Jim. Okay. So this is like a second year. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then I had a little list of things to do to get ahead. What I spent personal spending on and here are my debts. Ah, the debts. I don't miss these. I don't miss these at all. So $32,000 worth of debt here. Um, let's see. Yeah. Some of them were medical debts. Most were these student loan debts. I had medical debts because I didn't have insurance. And I said how much I paid. And then I had some plans to like ask to settle all sorts of stuff. It was, it was not much. And let's hop over to, that's a video that's coming up. It's going to be right here because I use it all the time. My budget now, and it's still kind of the basic format, but as you can see, it's a little prettier. Uh, and you can see how much I've made so far this month. I haven't been paid for any YouTube associated things, but I made 3,100. At a &M, I've made a hundred dollars so far with Budget Girl. <laughs> Jacob did pay me, and that's the BG property stuff. So now I have expenses, savings, investments, and here's all of my personal spending. And then I have a section over here for just some uh, spending for a girls' trip I'm doing. I also down here have a property expense spreadsheet and my net worth tracker, which is my favorite thing on the planet. If you're, uh, if you get one thing out of this call, I say start tracking your net worth. Cause I know y'all are probably all doing a little bit of saving and investing. And it's really incredible how much your money can grow. So, um, checking savings, retirements. And here's the thing. If I only started retirement savings a couple of years ago, like literally four years ago, and I already have this much saved. Take your freaking company match. 
okay <laughs> and uh yeah and then property assets so my net worth is currently one hundred sixteen thousand dollars which is not too bad considering that i was 33k in debt seven years ago and yeah we'll talk about I wouldn't scroll. Okay. And then down here, I've got business income and expenses, property income and expenses, and then kind of what I'm doing with various stuff. So that's that. I don't know how interesting that was to you, but you asked. So. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah. <laughs> thanks for being so open with your numbers. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. What size hustles help you clear your debt the most? Um, YouTube at the end there was really great. Um, delivery driving was the worst, to tell you the truth. Absolutely the freaking worst because so many people don't tip. And I think it's ludicrous. If you drive something to my house, you're getting $5 no matter what. Um, but not a lot of people think that way. And I was delivering for Hungry Howie's from the 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift, people. Like... If I'm coming to your house at 3 a.m., I expect $5. That's all there is to it. That's the price you pay because you're drunk or high and I brought you food. Just saying. Anyway, didn't make much off of that. Quit that job. Um, secret shopping was pretty good because I was able to do it kind of on weekends and lunch breaks. Best money was definitely through YouTube because I was doing it already. Second best money was uh, training dogs, which I'm not qualified for, but I can make a dog behave and uh, retail arbitrage. So picking up stuff at thrift stores and um, estate sales and stuff like that and selling it online. And now there are so many apps where that basically do it for you. You scan a barcode on something and it tells you how much it's worth and if you should buy it. Um, if you have more time than money, there's your, there's your thing. Also furniture flipping is a really good one if you have any skills whatsoever. We have, uh, we have a number of couch flippers on this call right nice. now. Nice. Love a couch flip. Yeah, just take off the ugly little dust ruffle. You're pretty good. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. How has your experience in College Station real estate market getting that duplex? It was not too bad. Um, so I think I bought it kind of the perfect time. I bought it in March of last year when the pandemic started, and that was terrifying at the same time. I was able to negotiate way down on my house because everyone was afraid and I had a HUD tenant. So the rent was guaranteed. Um, I ended up not renewing for that HUD tenant because she was a bit of a nightmare, but she didn't trash the place. So I consider that a win. Um, I got guaranteed rent for a year and now I've flipped it and I have a much higher paying tenant who's wonderful. Um, now shopping for my next spot in College Station is kind of hard because everyone's trying to buy right now. And I like a deal and a deal is hard to find, which is probably why I'm going to go short term next and do like a yurt or a uh, geodesic dome or like an airstream on a little piece of land and do kind of a glamping thing. Hmm. Okay. Besides your work and the business you run, what do you enjoy in your free time? Um, Jacob and I do a lot of garage sailing and estate sailing. Um, we, uh, I've been purchasing kind of unique stuff for my future Airbnb in kind of a taxi theme. And I, I enjoy that. We also like going to zoos and walking to dogs and playing with them and being general couch potatoes. We watch a lot of cooking shows and we also like to cook. So I also have a hammock out back that I'm a true old person. And I just, I, I go out in the backyard and I fall asleep in my hammock. Uh, would you have not gone to college if you could go back and not have to go into debt? Ooh. Hmm. So knowing what I know now, I still would have gone to college. I enjoy a desk job. I enjoy the opportunities, unfortunately, that are available to a white woman of privilege. I can, I can get a desk job essentially anywhere. Um, with a college degree, and it would be a little harder with that one. Uh, I'm, I like the stability of that. Uh, for other people, I do not think it's necessary to, that everyone go to college. Um, I think trade schools are incredible if you have uh, the liking for that. Um, I heard someone might be going into the military. That's an option. My dad was military. Um, 
you'll pay for your college at the very least. That said, I know there, I have a real estate friend here now who's um, still, I think, in, enlisted or he's not active duty or something anymore, but he feels behind. He's trying to do the real estate thing now. He owns two duplexes and he kind of feels like his time in the military where he didn't have a lot of options meant that he couldn't do a lot of the entrepreneurship and side hustles that he did. Very structured. You don't really get a choice on where you go and they kind of limit stuff when you're in there. Just advice from the void. Um, top three favorite books. Oh, actually I'm going to do, did you enjoy going to college first? Yeah, I love college. It was great. I went to a really tiny university, Mississippi University for Women in uh, Columbus, Mississippi, and I made a ton of friends and it was a co-ed college. They just couldn't make up their mind on it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of friends that I'm still in touch with today. I'm actually going on vacation in Tennessee with a few of them specifically from my uh, Equate version of a sorority. We call them social clubs, but we didn't have to pay to like a, a nationals um, this weekend in Tennessee. So, um, okay. Top three favorite books. Set for Life by Scott Trench, I think is a really, really great guide, especially for young people and what to do to get to your first hundred K. I wish I had read it before I did that. Um, also, he's a really awesome guy. Y'all love bigger pockets. Um, I don't see it right this second, but despite all the crap that Dave Ramsey is doing right now, I think that his total money makeover is a really good kind of stupid, simple plan for getting out of debt. Um, I think his advice to forego a 401k match is stupid. I think his advice on credit cards is stupid. And I think that a lot of his advice comes from a place of he wants to make money off of you, which is why he recommends uh, mutual funds <laughs> instead of index funds and MLMs, which not a fan of, but the simple save a thousand dollars, which should probably be more because he's been giving that advice for 40 years and inflation has happened. And then just do like one debt at a time, save up a bigger emergency fund, try to cash flow as much as possible, has some merit. It's not overwhelming. And Rich Dad Poor Dad, which you've all probably read. Let's see. All right. Do I invest in the stock market? Yes. I just don't talk about it much because I find it boring. I invest in uh, VT Sachs, um, 500 bucks a month and uh, sometimes a little more. And I have a little side account for gambling where I own a little Doge, a little Starbucks and some completely other random stuff. Uh, I did sell Doge when I doubled it and now I've bought in with half again, but I don't, it's not an everyday thing. I don't enjoy it. So I just throw I think it's six or $700 a month to that at this point, which is really cool that I don't, that I have that much money now to think about. Cause you just saw my first budget. Investing was not an option then. <laughs> and yeah, it's just growing every single month, contributing to my network, which is awesome. I just prefer to uh, spend more time and energy on fun stuff like real estate. I right, Sarah, I think you might've missed a couple questions above that oh, one. Oh, did I? Okay. Um, uh, throw them at me. I think Jabbar said, what are some of the KPIs associated with your personal brand? Someone's gonna have to tell me what a KPI is first. <clears throat> that is a key performance indicator, but Jabbar, what are you, what are you going for there? Um, so basically I'm just trying to understand what exactly, like how are you, how, like how are you track, tr how are you tracking what actions you're doing are attracting like certain results in your personal event brand. So like what posts are maybe going to yield more views over other ones or who like your target niches and different things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have some kind of overview level info on that, but my friends who are like deep into algorithm, like digging to figure out exactly like what the retention point is on their video and how they can like, fix it so that people don't stop watching there. We'll tell you that I'm, I really kind of suck at uh, the, the deep level analytics. I can tell just based off of my backend analytics on YouTube, what videos people like and people don't. I alluded earlier to like, anytime I do like a 10, 
things that save me money. It, it's an easy 20,000 views. That said, I, I make like a real estate video sometimes and it gets 5,000. So I try to do kind of a little peppering in of both to keep myself sane. The uh, sponsors generally like to do the 10 things I don't buy anymore videos and the like, which does keep new audiences coming in. And I hope that they will stick around to actually watch the videos that I'm a little bit more passionate about. Um, so I can look at the analytics on that just based off of how many views I get. My last two videos only got like 6,000 views, which is terrible for my channel, but that could be a algorithm no longer favoring me this Thursday, or it could be people don't like the two last videos that I put out and I need to do some more SEO work to uh, make them a little bit more fun to watch or more searchable at least. Um, okay. Also that said, the biggest areas of success on YouTube are for people that do SEO friendly videos and searchable videos. I have a friend who's extremely successful, Chris Winter, and all of his videos are just as SEO friendly as possible. He has like 300,000 views and all of his videos are just how to do this on WordPress, how to do this on this app, how to do what on this app. And he makes $20,000 a month and mm -hmm. I make 1500 a month. So there's that. That said, I would blow my brains out if I had to create videos like that to make money. Um, I don't enjoy it. So there's a little bit of a balance there. As for on social, I just try not to worry too much about how many likes or comments or anything like that it's getting. The only time I even look at those numbers is when a sponsor asks me to like show the screenshots of my recent things. And generally anytime I do something even vaguely, um, so I, so I did a yard sale haul in my Instagram recently and I was not wearing a bra under the shirt I was wearing. You could not see anything except the outline of my tit and titty gate ensued where some woman told me like, I know I'm going to get slammed for this, but please wear a bra. And I was like, no shakes tits in her general direction. And that spawned off like 12,000 views a day for the next two months and all sorts of people clapping back and, me just being like, I'm not going to wear a bra yard sailing or, and you do not have to watch. Uh, and yeah, it, it spurned some like body empowerment stuff. But anyway, I do something incinerating about twice a year with no plan to do so. It just happens. And that ups my, my views a lot. <laughs> Whatever works. I'm really, I'm really sorry. <laughs> that said, if you want to see a grown woman just dissolve into madness, I always keep those in like story highlight folders on my on my pages. I did a really horrible thing. I, I, was, I took a picture of myself in a swimsuit in a hotel where you couldn't see anything, and that just blew shit up. Just how dare I have a body? I think I should take the next question. <laughs> that was not helpful to anyone. Uh, let's say, yeah, just don't, like shit just happens. And uh, especially with your personal brand, you kind of have to decide when you're going to back down when you're not. I had someone come at me today because they, uh, they said Airbnbs are like bad for the planet and I shouldn't do one because even if I'm not stealing low wage or reasonable income properties from people I'm supporting the industry that like killed them in New Orleans. And I was just like, no, I'm just not going to answer you. Just, you have to pick your battles. I saw a, uh, a video on Instagram recently. It was Pitbull talking about haters. And he basically said, if you don't have haters, then you're, you're not doing something right. Or you're, Oh, definitely. You're not, you're not pushing the envelope. If, if you don't have people attacking you, on a consistent basis, then you're too comfortable. So he said, I, I love, I love my haters. They prove to me that I'm doing things correctly. There is an entire forum, um, dedicated to, uh, making fun of me on the internet. 
Uh, there's a site called the Gossip Bakery, and they have these threads on all sorts of different people, and they really hate me <laughs> just a lot. And I quit looking at it a very long time ago. Uh, sometimes I have Jacob look at it just to tell me if like there's anything I need to know. Um, they've even like doxed me on there and stuff. But generally on my, my actual channels, I get to decide who gets to be in that space. So if you're going to come for me and you're going to be rude to me, I'm just going to block you. Um, other people come at it as, uh, Jeff Rose likes to engage with the haters and just go the back and forth, but I don't have the mental energy for that. I'm just going to block you and move on. All right. I think we got, um, if you don't mind sticking around for just a couple more questions, Sarah, then we'll kind of wrap it up here, I think. Okay. Yeah. We have a net worth one. Okay. Always happy to do these. So real estate assets, you do count the debt against your net worth. You count the value minus the debt associated on it. So on my net worth tracker, you might not have seen it, but the value of the real estate, I actually only have two things in my physical assets um, column. It's my house and my car. And I just use whatever the recently assessed value was. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not having it as 300,000 because it hasn't been as appraised as that. I've just got it as the 240. It was last appraised as, and then I've got like the 218 that I currently owe on it subtracted. So both go into your net worth and then you're only getting that slice that you actively own. All right. Um, Ethan had one question up here said, what do you think is the best way to actually find affiliates? Oh, um, that's kind of easy. Let me... And I'll, I'll say he's, he's asking because he, Ethan, who's on the call, who by the way is 15. Are you 16 now, Ethan? Yes, I'm 16. 16. He is an avid couch flipper and created an online course that he's now just kind of starting to get off the ground as a passive income stream. That is so He's awesome. killing it. He's killing it. So I think he's kind of asking, uh, he said, I sell a course on side hustle and I have a, that I have experience in that would be couch flipping, but I'm having a hard time connecting with uh, and working with affiliates. So, okay. So um, I don't know if affiliates are going to want to work with you on couch flipping, but people who go to your site or your course that want to make money passively might be interested. So the reason I brought this up is this is my affiliate tracking spreadsheet where it tells me how much I make from who and what my tracking links are. Um, and even like the ad debt text and conditions and stuff like that. So these, you might want to take a screenshot are the different affiliate directories. So you can apply to be an affiliate person for impact radius. And they have like contracts with 30 different companies and you can go in there and then apply individually to um, be an affiliate for M1 Finance or Instacart or Canva or whatever. You can do the same thing with Aragorn Premium, with AdBloom, with, and some of these are direct or none. So like for Poshmark, I just use the refer a friend thing on my Poshmark. I'm sure someone has an affiliate for them, but sometimes they don't. Also, if there's a particular company you want to work with, just type in article affiliate platform and you can usually figure out who they have contracting with. Um, generally for they outsource these, it's not going to be you contact the actual company and figure something out sometime, maybe, but most of the time they're going to be with these people. So these different things like medium, Impact Radius, AdBloom, Aragorn, and there are others. And you can log into those, see if they have any companies that you would want to partner with, and then just sign up for it in the app. Often it'll say like, what's your name, what's your website, or what's your platforms, what's your audience. And sometimes they will accept or decline you based on your reach, but often they'll just give you a shot. And if you can move some of their stuff, then you can even work with them to get like a higher sign up. Like City just released an $80 sign up instead of a $60 sign up. So, and then what you can start doing is utilizing those links in content that you use. So in your YouTube description box or in something like your, so I use this, uh, 
I push people this direction a lot where I'm like, here are all of my recommended products and services. And I have affiliates with all of these people. Um, and I also even have something similar. So this is my IG link and I had a website person just set it up where you can, instead of having like a link tree or something, this is actually my website and you can get to all of my stuff through here and uh, like my Amazon shop. And then I make money off of that when you, when I'm wearing something and someone says like, Hey, where did you get the thing? And I'm like, Oh, I got it on Amazon. It's in my Amazon shop. And the Amazon affiliates program is a really good place to start. All right, sir. Um, we're kind of at the end of our time and uh, I want to respect your time and let you go here and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, but thank you so much for jumping on this call with us. It was awesome. Um, and, you know, we even got some laughs and, and uh, learned some behind the scenes stuff with how to get more followers and more comments and more engagement. Uh, so thank you for taking the time. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I think the first time we connected, I reached out to you and asked you to do, and I, I was just kind of thinking about this when you were answering the questions. Um, you filled out a survey for me, uh, a, a case study basically, that's going to be in a book that Bigger Pockets is publishing that's going to be released in November. So thank you, now that I can actually say it to your face, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, and uh, when the book comes out, I'll definitely let you know and you're gonna be in it as one of the, I think there's only gonna be eight, maybe even six case studies actually in the book. Some will be bonus material, but I think you're one of the ones that made the cut to be in the actual book. So thank you for doing that for me. I'm honestly yeah. honored. And I hope the, I don't know if the numbers are updated since I refied, cause now I make money instead of, and had the HUD tenant. Oh, well. Yeah, it was, it wasn't. It was still a good deal. There, there wasn't too much number specific questions. It was more about. Oh, okay. Uh, other stuff. It, I'm sure it's still very relevant. So appreciate that. Thank you for all that you do out there. And thanks for being on the call with us. Uh, and I'll definitely be keeping in touch and uh, I'll see you in Austin, I think, uh, September. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, look forward and to meeting you. guys, it was very, very nice to meet all of you. If you have any specific questions or anything, um, including about affiliates and stuff like that, or even, you know, what is a fair deal if somebody reaches out for you for your first sponsorship i'm always happy to take a look i have uh i learned the hard way and i want to help you guys um in whatever way i can so feel free to reach out on uh social i'm i don't have an assistant i check all my messages <laughs> awesome thanks for that sarah and um yeah we'll keep in touch thank you so much have a good rest of your night you feel free to take off i'm going to wrap it up with the group here and then um if you like this video and want to see more like it, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You should also go check out our website and Instagram, which are both linked below this video. Thanks again for watching. Now go and get your freak on.